Hello, and welcome to Supersymmetry and Conformal Field Theory. Uh, these first three lectures are going to try and explain why supersymmetry and conformal field theory are subjects worth of study. Uh, we're going to focus on symmetry in general, how symmetry plays a really important role in, in theoretical physics, and then why these two particular forms of symmetry, supersymmetry and, and conformal symmetry, are, are so important for, uh, for what we do, not only in this class here, but in the other classes that you're taking as part of this MSc. Let's get started. Symmetry. There are many different kinds of symmetry in theoretical physics. There's gauge symmetry. Uh, an example of gauge symmetry is the SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 of the standard model of particle physics. Uh, another set of uh, symmetries that we're interested in in theoretical physics, they're global symmetries. So while gauge symmetries are local in nature, they, you can have different rotations, if you will, at different points in, in space-time and still have a symmetry of the overall theory. Global symmetries, you have to perform the same rotation, rotation in scare quotes, at every point uh, throughout, your, throughout your space. So an example of that might be the uh, approximate SU2 flavor symmetry of the up and down quarks. So if the up and down quarks were both massless, this would be an exact, exact symmetry of the theory, but they're not, and they have slightly different masses, and so this, this, this symmetry is broken, but you can still use it since it's, they have almost the same mass, they're almost massless. You can use it as an approximate uh, symmetry to gain some insight into the, the physics of, uh, of quarks. Another important example of, of, uh, of symmetries are, are discrete symmetries. Uh, so an example of, of a di discrete symmetry is charge conjugation, another one is parity, Another is time reversal. So hopefully, if you've taken uh, the quantum field theory module uh, last term, uh, you'll have been introduced to some of these global symmetries, discrete symmetries, gauge symmetries. And now there's one that's going to be a very important one for us here in this, in this class. Uh, it's the notion of uh, the Poincaré group or Poincaré symmetry. These are the space-time symmetries of special relativity, so also called uh, the Poincaré group. They consist of space-time translations, of, of spatial rotations, and also of Lorentz boosts. So you put all those different uh, group actions together, they form what's known as the Poincaré group. Now, the Poincaré group plays a very special role for us here because, well, if we think about quantum field theory, a subject near and dear to my heart, quantum field theory was born from a marriage between special relativity and quantum mechanics. So by trying to make quantum mechanics consistent with the Poincaré group, uh, with the space-time symmetries of special relativity, people were forced to develop uh, this notion of, of relativistic quantum field theory. So because of that, the Poincaré group plays a, a, a very special role for us. And one can ask a question, well, if it's such a, it's such a special thing, are there, are there some ways of uh, maybe putting it in some broader context, or, 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 or could there be other examples that are related to the Poincaré group that are also, also kind of maybe central for physics? Uh, and that, that leads us to uh, the notion of supersymmetry and conformal field theory, as we'll see. So we ask the following question. Can the Poincaré group be extended? Can it be some non-trivial subgroup of some larger set of symmetries? It's very easy to make it a sort of trivial subgroup. Just take your other favorite group and take a direct product, right? Some rotation group, internal rotation group in your theory in the Poincaré group. Uh, but then if that's true, all the, all the generators will commute. You can multiply them in any order. And so it's a very sort of trivial way of extending the Poincaré group. What I'm interested in is some less trivial thing where the elements of this extension don't commute trivially with the Poincaré. And so it, it, really, is, it really is enlarging the group in some, some significant fashion rather than just a trivial one. Now the answer to this question is a, is a surprising no. Uh, there's a theorem that was proven by two physicists a number of years ago, Coleman and Mandula, which say that if you have any additional symmetries in your theory, some additional internal symmetries, um, they all have to commute trivially with the Poincaré group. So for example, if, if you had some SU3 internal group, maybe it's the color symmetry of quantum chromodynamics or some other internal symmetry group, G and SU3 and H, some element H in the Poincaré group, then it must be that those two elements commute. There's no way to, to non-trivially extend uh, Poincaré by these internal symmetry groups. Okay, so that would be the end of the story, except uh, we have this, this class I want to teach, and so clearly there may, must be some loopholes uh, to, this, to this, this, uh, this important theorem. There are, in fact, two important loopholes. One 
is conformal symmetry, which will be the first half of, of, this, uh, of this module. And the second one uh, is supersymmetry, which I'll almost always abbreviate in, this, uh, in these lectures uh, by the four letters SUSY. And, and why are these loopholes? Well, we'll talk more about this uh, next week when we get more into the details of the Poincaré group and conformal symmetry and supersymmetry. This is a very high level discussion right now, just to try to whet your interest uh, for, for why you should be here listening to me for the next 11 weeks. So how, how do these loopholes arise? In the case of the conformal symmetry group, there's an assumption uh, in the proof, the proof relies, the proof of coleman mandula that is, it relies on the existence of something called the S matrix or the scattering matrix, which is a fairly problematic concept for, for field theories with conformal symmetry. And so because the proof relies on the S matrix and the S matrix is not really there, uh, the proof doesn't work. And SUSY, it's a little bit more subtle how that, that winds up uh, being an exception. So in this case, the proof assumes a Lie algebra, uh, that, the, that the, the symmetry, um, these continuous symmetries, it's important that the, these internal symmetries be uh, continuous, so Lie groups, if you will. They rely on having some internal Lie algebra, uh, which generates the Lie group. Whereas supersymmetry is a generalization of a, of, a, of a Lie algebra. Supersymmetry requires what's known as a Lie superalgebra instead. And we'll talk more about what that actually means next week. And so there's this other loophole that Coleman and Mandula were saying, well, if the, in our, my continuous symmetry is generated by a Lie algebra, then I have this result. Uh, whereas supersymmetry is saying, well, I don't have a Lie algebra, I have something else, some other uh, generalization of a Lie algebra called a Lie superalgebra. And then, indeed, Poincaré gets extended. There are other loopholes uh, in, in, in Coleman Mandula. There are other loopholes that we really won't touch on at all in this course. Uh, they, they are quite interesting. One, as I've already just hinted by, by emphasizing this notion of Lie algebra and continuous symmetry are, are, are discrete symmetries. Discrete symmetries uh, evade the, this, this coleman mandula theorem. You can non-trivially extend Poincaré by various discrete symmetries. And another important example are so-called spontaneously broken symmetries. So if you're, the ground state of your, your theory uh, breaks, your theory has the symmetry, but the ground state breaks the symmetry, it turns out in this situation, you can non-trivially combine this internal symmetry group with, with Poincaré and get something non-trivial. So that's also a very important idea, but, but we, won't, we won't talk about uh, these examples in, in, in the module. So getting back to the topic at hand, you know, there's this, this natural idea then, so you know, Poincaré formed this really important uh, the Poincaré group formed this really important notion of asymmetry. It was sort of the seed for, for the birth of quantum field theory, uh, for wedding special relativity and quantum mechanics. And now we have these two intriguing loopholes, uh, ways of non-trivially extending uh, Poincaré, which suggests that you know, supersymmetry and conformal symmetry must play this really you know, important role in, in, in quantum field theory if we could only figure out what it was. And, and so, you know, well, do they, or is it just some accident that you can extend it, extend Poincaré in this fashion? Is it just something of you know, purely academic interest? Now, it turns out these two subjects are, are quite important, and I'll just list a few details uh, why we care about both of these concepts. And then in the next two lectures this week, I'll try to flesh out these details uh, with, with more, more storytelling. So conformal symmetry. Why else might we care about conformal symmetry? Well, it turns out conformal symmetry is very important in the study of critical phenomena. This is the study of phase transitions in condensed matter and, and statistical physics. So maybe your, your system is not, doesn't have conformal symmetry in general, but if you bring it very close to a second order phase transition, it in general will, or, or it quite often does have this additional symmetry, this conformal symmetry. Another important reason to learn about conformal symmetry uh, is for the renormalization group in quantum field theory. So I'll often abbreviate renormalization group here as just the two letters RG in, in QFT. So you probably have some taste of what this means if you took the quantum field theory module last semester, and I'm sure they'll get into much more detail uh, this semester with the advanced, advanced course. Uh, so they're, they're fixed points of the renormalization group, which typically have this conformal symmetry. And last but not least, uh, it's a very important technical tool in string theory. 
So for those of you in the string theory module, um, there's a lot of what I say here in the first half of this course well, where we discuss conformal symmetry, which may be useful, may be useful to you there. All right, so that's, that's three reasons to care about conformal symmetry. Now let, let me give you some reasons to care about supersymmetry also. Uh, there are two broad classes of reasons to care about supersymmetry. There are experimental reasons and there are theoretical ones. Uh, and the experimental ones, uh, I'll, I'll again give much more detail in, 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 in a couple of lectures, but uh, very broadly speaking, the idea is that one may see evidence for supersymmetry in high energy experiments. It hasn't been seen to date, but maybe in the next generation of particle accelerators or, or other high energy experiments, dark matter detectors, uh, precision electroweak experiments, variety of other options, you might see a supersymmetric particle. Uh, now this is a hope that's been held out and dangled before, uh, before physicists for decades now, and, and no one has yet seen it, uh, but still it may be just around the corner. We may see some uh, super, evidence for supersymmetry in, in, in the lab. So that's a very exciting prospect for uh, us theoretical physicists who at the high energy limit who've been maybe starved of, of uh, experimental data now for, for many years. And there's another very important class of reasons to care about supersymmetry which are, are purely theoretical in nature. Uh, and, and very broadly I can just say that the presence of symmetry often helps solve a problem. So again, the next two mini lectures I'll help flesh uh, both of these out in, in much more detail. Uh, but before I get there and before I end today, I'd like to give you a brief uh, course outline, how I plan to fill out the next 11 weeks of our time. So next week, um, what I'll do is I will, uh, I will begin chapter two of, of the notes, uh, and where I'll, I'll try and give much more details behind the argument I gave in the first part of this lecture. I'll try and tell you much more about the Poincaré group and coleman mandula although without giving you a proof of coleman mandula The problem is that the, the techniques for the proof are not really germane to the techniques uh, that I'll use in the rest of the course. And so it's, it's really a, a, quite a detour to take us to prove that and then come back and discuss conformal symmetry and, and supersymmetry. But for those of you who are interested, there's some nice resources online. You can just read about it on your, on your own time. Uh, some of them I think are, are quite well, well written. There's even a nice discussion, I think, by, by Mandula himself, uh, where you can, you can read about how to prove, prove it. So instead, what I'll do here in chapter two is we'll review the Poincaré group, which I hope you saw in a quantum field theory uh, module. We'll review what I mean by internal symmetry. I know I said those words like I expected everyone knew exactly what I meant, and probably that's not true, but next week I will say exactly what it means. I will say a little bit in more detail exactly what Coleman Mandula says. Uh, I'll dis discuss how Susie is a loophole and also how uh, conformal symmetry is also a loophole and what conformal symmetry is. What supersymmetry is, I'm afraid, we're, is going to really have to wait to the second half of the course because first I have to develop some technology about spinners, uh, which, which, we'll wait, which we'll wait till later. So, so my, my, my broad plan here is to divide the course after chapter two into two halves. Um, we'll have chapters three, four, and five, which are all going to be about conformal symmetry. And we'll have chapters uh, six, seven, and eight, which will all be about supersymmetry. And I think that will take us to the end. If, it's, if it doesn't, there's all sorts of great stuff I can talk about, all sorts of great ways to fill our time uh, for the rest, of the, the rest of the 11 weeks. This is my first time uh, going through the material in this particular fashion, so I'm not totally sure how much uh, time each, each, uh, each section will take up. So we'll play it by ear a little bit as we go forward. But that's, that's the rough plan. So let me tell you a little bit more about what's in each of these chapters. So chapter three, what's chapter three? Chapter three is gonna be constraints from conformal symmetry. How this symmetry constrains uh, the form of the correlation functions, uh, important operators like the stress tensor, that's, that's chapter three. Chapter four is gonna be a discussion of two uh, conceptual tools uh, that people often use in the study of conformal field theory. Uh, these are the notions of radial quantization, where the radius of, of your space becomes kind of like a time coordinate, and so instead of propagating through time as we usually do in quantum field theory, in this conformal, in this conformal field theory context, we propagate uh, outward uh, 
in, in some radial direction. And I'll explain how that works. And the other important tool here is going to be the operator product expansion. In this chapter four, I'm developing these two tools because they, they lead kind of naturally into the payoff for our study of conformal field theory. I'd like to talk a little bit about the conformal bootstrap. So this is an old idea that goes back to the 70s and early 80s, but that has had a, a recent rebirth in, in, in the research literature. And so there's a lot of exciting new progress uh, surrounding this idea of the conformal bootstrap of using something called crossing symmetry to, to constrain the form of four-point functions and learn about the space of conformal field theories. And those will rely on, on, on what we develop in chapters three and four. I see that as kind of the payoff for the first half of the, of the module. And then we'll switch to supersymmetry. So chapter six, I mentioned it, it's gonna take me a while to develop the notion of the supersymmetry algebra. Uh, and, and the reason for that is I have to develop all this technology around spinners, how to deal with uh, fermionic objects like electrons and, and neutrinos. So we'll have to talk about spinners. And because I'm really kind of a formal guy, I like to do it in not just four dimensions, but in, in, in general dimensions. I find it's a very useful exercise. If you just do it in four dimensions, I think you get some misconceptions about what spinners really are. Uh, and this is necessary again uh, for understanding the supersymmetry algebra. So chapter seven, uh, we'll talk about the consequences of supersymmetry, just like in chapter uh, four, we talked about the consequences of some consequences of conformal symmetry. Uh, this will be constraints on the spectrum of theories with supersymmetry, uh, something called the Witten index. And then finally in chapter eight, we'll get our hands dirty and we'll write down some simple uh, supersymmetric field theories to see how this notion of supersymmetry plays out in, in practice. We'll talk about something called the West Amino model, and we'll also talk about um, uh, the super Maxwell field. So if you make the photon supersymmetric, uh, what does the field theory look like? So there are unfortunately many things I won't have time to talk about uh, in these 11 weeks. Let me list a few so that you know now, uh, you can have your disappointment now and not, not be surprised uh, when I don't talk about these things 11 weeks from now. So there's many, many gaps. I'm unfortunately not going to have time to talk about CFT in two dimensions, which is a wonderful subject uh, with many very nice and beautiful results. And I really wish I had time to do it. But if I did that, I wouldn't be able to talk at all about supersymmetry. I am not going to be able to talk about superspace techniques. Uh, so there's this whole technology people have introduced to try and make the notation and supersymmetry more compact and useful and easier. Uh, it's, a, it's a worthwhile exercise to, to go through and do that, but I feel that I don't need it to introduce it, introduce supersymmetry at a conceptual level, and so I'm just going to stay away from it. I feel like it would be a distraction, and then we'd have less, pay, less in the way of payoff. I'm not going to talk about uh, supersymmetric non-abelian gauge theories. This is, again, a real shame. Uh, I was talking about how the standard model of particle physics uh, is, is maybe one of the motivations for studying supersymmetry, for looking for physics beyond the standard model. You can make it supersymmetric and see what that means in detail. And the standard model is a non-abelian gauge theory. And so we won't be able to see that in detail. The closest we'll get to it is understanding this Maxwell field. But maybe that's enough to give you a taste of what uh, the supersymmetry looks like in, in the more complicated non-abelian context. And another thing I won't be able to talk about, which is unfortunate from a historical perspective, is supergravity, since a lot of work was done in the development of supergravity uh, here at King's uh, by people like Peter West and others. Um, so supergravity, it's a way to make theory of gravitation supersymmetric. So I won't be able to talk about that either. All right, so that brings me to the end of the outline. Let me talk a little bit about references for this, this material, about sources. So the sources for my, uh, my notes on, on conformal field theory, I've made very liberal use of some notes I found by uh, Fernando Aldai at Oxford. And my notes for supersymmetry, I borrowed very heavily from some notes written by Neil Lambert, who taught this, uh, taught this module in previous years when it was a purely uh, super, supersymmetry module, when we didn't introduce any discussion at all about, um, about conformal field theory or conformal symmetry. So for additional references, of which there are many, many useful ones, please see the end of the class notes, and uh, I'll give you a lot of uh, links uh, to various, uh, uh, various literature, some of which you can access freely. Uh, some are books that you probably have to pay for. 
And if, if one of you finds a good reference uh, that you really like, please let me know. I'm always looking for uh, better ways of explaining this material. And if I can crowdsource that, uh, it would be fantastic. Okay, so that ends my first mini lecture. Uh, tune in next time and I'll discuss in more detail uh, why you should care about conformal field theories and conformal symmetry. Mm -hmm.